Welcome to the third video in the series of research mentoring initiatives. This video is going to try and explain a TRRT, which means a Theory Research Relevance Tree. Now to give you some background to this, this is really a 2D, two-dimensional view of building maybe a storyline, maybe a thesis subset of sequences of subheadings, but really it's an abstract method to help you to think. So let's first discuss maybe some analogies and similarities. Well if you've heard of the HTA, Hierarchical Task Analysis, it's similar to that. If you've actually heard of a family tree, the layout of this is maybe exactly similar to that. And we'll see that in a minute. And then there's Jackson Structured Programming. Again, they're all tree type diagrams and it's also analogous to a decision tree. So let's look at some of these and I'll try and highlight why they're important and how they're used. The first thing to realize about a TRRT is you should do them or undertake them in a logbook. So let's just explain why you scribble them down by pencil or by ink on paper. Well these diagrams are used for you to maybe with two people or more or just yourself discuss and visualize what you're going to research or what you're going to write in a book or a publication or just to get you thinking about your area of research. So I'm going to go through a number of hand-drawn diagrams and then finally I'm going to move on to a Visio diagram and explain a bit more about the different areas of the diagram. The first thing to realize about the diagram is it is like a family tree. So up here will be the subject, maybe the subject of your book or the subject of your research, and then the sub-issues. Now the next thing to realize is that this tree is parsed when you start developing a sequence of subheadings for the final writing of a book or undertaking a thesis or a technical memorandum or a journal or a paper. So there's a number of ways to theoretically parse a tree. One is depth first, so I'll just visualize this in front of you. Depth first starts at the head node and then goes through the edges down to the deepest one, say on the left, and then the next and the next. And you'll see that's basically how it parses the tree and that's called depth first. The other way is width first so it'll go along here and then along there and along there. So the way we're going to use to transpose this into a sequence of text subheadings is actually depth first and we'll show you that in a minute. Now let's go through a number of evolutions of these. These were myself and Hassan, my present PhD student, trying to work out his research areas and how we should order them to start putting them into his thesis and technical memorandum. So this is his first as you can see here. Moving on to number two you'll see we're starting to clean up some of the areas. We're starting to scribble and move them around. So what do I mean by move them around? Well the orders of these from left to right will actually be placed one above the other in the sequence of writing the book or the journal. So let's go and explore another one. So as you can see, we're slowly evolving, we're changing some of the subject context, we're moving things around. So these are actually drawn in a logbook on a piece of paper in real time. Both myself and Hassan can then communicate our ideas of how the storyline, the research field should evolve, and what are its subdomains, and how they should be organized. So you can see the sequence is changing. This is page three in the diagrams or logbook. Now we're on to page four, and now you can see we're starting to change the details. So in a minute I'm going to explain that there's actually two areas to a research relevance tree like this. Now you can start seeing the form, and a bit later on I'm going to explain the importance of these headings here to guide you through what you're undertaking. But at the moment I'm trying to show that theory research relevance tree should be scribbled out for you to start thinking, for you to start being creative about what's my storyline, what's my research field, what's my subdomains, how do I link them up, how do I sequence through them. Let's go on to the next diagram. So again you're seeing we're getting to um, diagram five, you're starting to see that we're getting a bit more detailed. 
And now we're going to start his chapter. So we've moved from, if you like, abstract methods of talking about the field to now planning his thesis chapter. Sorry about the uh, fuzzy diagram, but you'll start seeing that we go through chapter by chapter and we start laying out the sub-components of each chapter. And you can see how it's broken down. And again you can see the detail. Now in a minute I'm going to explain all this detail and how it works. Again some more detail. Now you can see quite a lot of detail here. So now let's look at a Visio diagram of this and try and explain, if you like, the importance of the TRRT and really get inside it. Well, let's first start by the right hand side and explain really what the TRRT is all about. First, if you're undertaking research or a project or maybe even writing a book, the first thing you have to do is decide on the thesis, which is your objective. Now be careful here because while I'm mentoring students say of PhD or project, we never set the title. We might have five titles, we might have three, and during the work evolution we might change the title. That means how we feel about the namespace that we've developed during developing this and how the article should focus on a title that represents what its theme is. So the objective is aligned directly to the theme of the work or the book. Now what's under this? Well the fundamental domains. If you like the storylines of the book from left to right or the sub the main domains of the research field. So these domains you're looking at, we're looking at global optimization and evolutionary computing modeling and it's got a number of subdomains from diversity control to convergence analysis to hybridization strategies and then parameters. Now there if you like the highest hierarchy in our family tree and below these we start moving into subdomains. Now the subdomains are each strategic area can be broken down into a number of sub areas. So you're starting to see that, ah, oh, now I can visualize if I've got one storyline, how it breaks down and fragments into two areas. Hopefully this will help you visualize it. Remember this is the final one. I wouldn't recommend you do this if you're planning storylines in Visio. It wastes your time and it takes too long. So let's go through again. First, the top level title of the book and its objective embedded in its title. Then, a fundamental domains in the case of research. In the case of a book, this will be the maybe the chapters that you're going to cover. Then we move on to possible approaches that this research leads to. Maybe in a book it's possible storylines. Now the important thing to realize is I must highlight that here is a boundary. Why is there a boundary and why is the diagram split into two? And here's a line that splits it into two. Well when you're undertaking research, the first thing you have to realize is there's lots of research already done. So you have to investigate the domains and then the subdomains in those domains and then make a decision. So here is a decision boundary. So let's just jump to the third issue here on this sidebar and just explain how this evolves. So first you're going to develop a title of your work, which is the objective maybe, or a line to in your research. Then you're going to develop the fundamental domains in it. Then you're going to move on and start realizing that in those domains they have possible approaches. And then finally move on to selecting an approach that you're going to adopt, maybe for your storyline or a book, or for your way of undertaking your research. And then you're going to, in the case of research, and when the type of research we do, we're going to build data structures and algorithmics and mathematical models to undertake that research and evaluate experiments and build hypotheses. So let's just explain what's happening here, because you might be getting lost a bit here. So the top half of the diagram is a family tree of the different research areas, or the book sequencing through the chapters. Then we go into the metadata of the research areas, which are the meta sub areas of each research area. Then we start making decisions. So let's explain these decisions. So in this one, we're looking at research in the field of diversity control. And one way of doing it is initializing the population when it initially starts. The other way is to have multiple populations. So what did we decide to do? Well, we developed a brand new strategy for initializing um, the 
state space and the items in the state space and we call it state space partitioning and it's a, an, a, a heuristic which means it's a sort of guess, a sort of uh, methodology which might not be deterministic. And then we moved on to select a multi-pool strategy and we selected two. Dual means two. And then we had to divide our attentions onto convergence analysis and say well you could evaluate its limits or you could measure the diversity. We decided to measure it with two different metrics distance metric and an evolvability metric. Then we moved on to hybridization, again lots of different algorithmic methods and switching between them. I'm not going to explain too much of the research but the algorithmics are how you mix up the algorithmics. Do you have two? Do you have three? Do you have them all running at once concurrently or do you switch from one to two to three? And then the switching mechanism. How do you do it? And You'll start seeing they, they filter down to saying we're going to have a global then a local, so it's implicitly sequential. We go from the global search methodology to the local. And then we do undertake a switching from the one to the other using a tick particular method that we name collaborative. And we also realized when we were building um, INI, and this is so important for research scientists because I've read so many theses, been an internal or external in a viva at the end of a PhD, and they've no idea what parameter analysis and the model they've used they've just got oh that was derived that parameter from a paper wait a sec your model is slightly different to theirs it's got different numbers of inputs if it's a neural network it's got different structure why are you using what they say in the paper so this I'd like to get on my horse about and say parameter analysis is supremely important for us in research domain for sensitivity analysis. So we've got a mathematical model, we've got a set of parameters, we've got an algorithm. What happens if you change the parameters? What are the optimum parameter settings? Well what we've done is we do an extensive, all my students do an extensive analysis of their model and their parameters and then tune them. But then if we can move on from there we start adapting them. So we make the parameters automatic. So now you're seeing how maybe useful this theory research relevance tree. So let's look at some more vi Visio diagrams. This is a basic one. This is a top level view of the areas. Again just looking at the objectives and the fundamental domains and then some subdomains. Then another top level again looking at diversity control only and looking at the subdomains and then breaking it down into further granularity. So again fundamental domain at the top breaking it down to possible approaches. Then we move into a bit more detailed. Again, you're starting to see the granularity appear and how we break down and have a decision boundary here where we move from the possible approaches to the adopted approaches. And that would be really in a book from the possible storylines to the adapted approach or the, the approach you're going to take for your storyline. These last two are particularly for mathematics and research, really. And again, a detailed one. I'll let you scan these because hopefully you'll also download this added um, document as well once you've watched the video. And then another one, a bit more detail in the sub-issues, parameter control. Now this one, I thought I'd put this one in because it shows you a TRRT in use in a journal. Now here, one of the important things is we've been more a bit more explicit about the subdomains on the right here. And instead of just calling them fundamental domains, we've made sure that people understand that we're doing research, so they're fundamental research domains. And again, when we strategically break them down into subdomains and granularly break those down again, strategically we say possible research approaches. So again, it's directly aligned to research approaches. Now here's a more detailed one and we're going to explain the sub-issues a bit more detail. So again this is actually in a journal and you'll see that the keywords research and research here and here. So we're stressing that this is the research you undertake whereas under here once you've made your decision boundary here you start building a model and it's actually the mathematical model of the parameters and data structures which are combined with the math model, mathematical algorithmics as well. So you're starting to see these diagrams can get very detailed, hopefully help any reader understand how you evolved from this research in the present day to your research now and how your model has evolved and your data structures as well. Now we're going to show you one from, that was from a PhD student. This one 
is from a degree student. So this year, this is 2013, we started developing the TRT method and I rolled it out across all my students. I have approximately 15 students a year that I mentor once a week for about half an hour. So that could be uh, five from the first year, five from the second and five from the third. I also have PhD students. So this is from a degree student. Now this degree student was quite good. Um, I must tell you a little trick about projects which is most of our project students start in their final semester in semester start at September. Don't do that. They'll never get a first. They've never written a thesis. They won't be able to do it. I'll try and hint to my students that they start after the second year. This guy started straight after the second year and spent his summer building the software. At the end of it, with our ability to mentor and interact, we got for him a 90. And I think you'll agree mentoring is king. This diagram helped him visualize his structure of his thesis. This is his diagram that he roughed out in his log book. And that's the way they should be roughed out before he built this. This is how you're meant to delineate it. This is the first time I've shown you how you use a theory research relevance tree to go from a two dimensional diagram, a family tree, to a sequence of subheadings directly passed from this diagram. Okay, so you're starting to, oh, so I see. So a, a TRRT is just an abstraction that's then used to parse and then develop tables of contents for documents and that's exactly it. So not only is it used to be creative discussing the layout of our research and a book, but it's also used to evolve from a diagram to a sequence of textual statements to become subheadings. And you'll start seeing they really do evolve in sequence. So that's his first um, draft of the first set of chapters and that's his second set of chapters there. So that's from a degree student. This is from an MSc. So I also rolled it out to my MSCs. He actually did, we haven't got his uh, TRRT, so he scribbled them down in his logbook, but you'll see he then produced these MS Word tables of content. So that's about it. I guess the only thing you've got to do is now start visualizing your own TRRTs. It takes a bit of time and evolution to get used to this sort of construction. I suppose the only thing I'd warn you about is that this isn't writing the um, document. This is visualizing at a top level what the document's going to look like, be it a book, a journal, a thesis, or anything really. If you're going to think about writing, you could move and you can type this in Google and you'll get a lot of information or email me and I'll send you, or maybe I'll do a video later. later. Uh, a method for doing this. So some time ago a, a research scientist looked at a lot of papers and said is there a style, is there a general norm and he developed the CARS method. So I'll spell that out so you can type that in Google. It, Google. It's C-A-R-S. So if you want to start thinking about how would you write underneath these subheadings one of the methods, I'm not saying it's the best but if you've never done it before it's a starting point and worth reading the CARS method. So read up about the CARS method. Right, thank you very much for listening to this third Theory Research Relevance Tree in the Series of Mentoring Initiative. I hope it'll help you be creative. I hope it'll help you and a group or you and your mentor or you and your supervisor or you and your publisher develop storylines, develop research areas and think about what you're doing in a more abstract way. Thank you very much for listening.